A craftsman battles for perfection, never willing to give in or walk away. I'm Eric Gorgeous. I built custom motorcycles from the ground up, using the tools I was born with and skills passed on by countless generations before me. I wasn't always a motorcycle builder. I worked nine to five, chasing money and titles, and it nearly broke me. So I threw it all away and started over. I decided to work with my hands to feed my soul, and I've never looked back. I believe there's a craftsman in all of us. Join me on a quest to uncover the skills that built our society, one craftsman at a time. We'll discover what drives the men and women who I call my heroes. We'll learn their craft and maybe even find some inspiration along the way. There's a part of you in everything you do, your legacy, a craftsman's legacy. The history of woodworking dates all the way back to the Stone Age. Our entire civilization was built around it. So many of the tools woodworkers use today date back thousands of years. Designs so perfect they've lasted the test of time. And the craft itself is truly a living history with skills being handed down from generation to generation. That's how I learned woodworking, from my grandfather and father. Up until recently, boys were introduced to woodworking at an early age as part of a standard education, while girls were forced into home economics. Now, for the most part, those gender walls are gone, but so are the shop classes that taught many of us how to work with our hands. I believe it would be hard to find a teenager today who knows the difference between oak and maple or what a coping saw is, and that's sad. Traditional woodworking is being replaced by mass production. So its survival has fallen back on the craftsmen who are dedicated to passing on these age-old skills. It's just below zero outside, but my coffee's warm, and I'm about to meet up with someone I truly admire. So life's good. John Wilson is a woodworker, a writer, a teacher, and a true craftsman. I first sat down with him in a 200 square foot cabin that he built and called both home and workplace for 12 years. This is a creative space. It was one that a craftsman found congenial. And uh, that seems really strange to Americans because we uh, expand into incredible residential footprints. Much of the world's population lives and have their crafts going on in a space not much different than this. It's really quite doable and I, in many ways very freeing. How did you find woodworking? First with my dad. He had a small shop in our basement and so that's where I started. Did a school shop before so many of those were closed down. I felt very fortunate to have had that. So after that I uh, Worked in, uh, as a carpenter on, on house construction to put my through college. I was fortunate that back then you didn't have all the subcontractors, so you get a chance to do everything. When I was a kid, woodworking was in my family, you know, and I grew up around it. So it's very, um, it's very emotional for me because it was so special to me when I was a kid. You know, I just latched onto it immediately. Even before I started building motorcycles, when I had decided in my life that I wanted to start working with my hands for a living, I, I really went back mm. and forth over it for a while and I really seriously considered following a path through woodworking. I remember a person who took one of my classes observing the fact that when I would take a piece of wood, I, 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 you're tactile, you're, you're yes. connecting with it, because he found that a machinist doesn't do that. You, you, you get cut. And yeah. there's a lot of finesse and technique involved in it, but with woodworking, it's well, so... It, it's still an organic living material. True. And, and we have to deal with that in the trade because in the summer it expands and the winter it contracts. Yes. Whereas... In your metal world, it'll expand if it gets heated up, but you don't want your hand on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we have to do things that account for 
its organicness that's still there. You know, before working with John, I really didn't know a lot about Shaker woodworking traditions. During the process, I was really able to learn a lot about the simplicity, the functionality and beauty, and the high quality craftsmanship that they take pride in. Having its useful base, and then having it pleasing in appearance um, combines two really important parts of what we like to have around us. They've got it right, you know, for a number of reasons. First of all, they weren't concerned with style, so if they got something right, they could do it over and over and over again without having to come up with another model year. And they were in a religion that placed an obligation to doing your best. They had a definition of perfection as being the best you can do today. So the perfection was progressive. What you do tomorrow might well need to be a little better. One of the things I respect most about John is that he's willing to teach other people. It's so important for craftsmen to share their knowledge, to bring other people into their world. We're sponges and we absorb and we're unconscious about doing that. And when that's happening, you're connecting things. And uh, that's when it, it's good to work with your hands. John's a woodworker and a teacher. And by opening his shop up and teaching his skill to other people, that's his legacy. Tell me more about teaching and how did you get into it? Did you sort of fall into it or was it something that you were always drawn to? I was fortunate to have a a good liberal arts education and then two years of graduate work in the University of London and became an anthropologist, but there aren't too many jobs out there for anthropologists. I mean, not like engineers or computer scientists people. So there are not too many things you can do, but the vast majority of us teach. I enjoy having people come and they're expectant and they go away that their expectations were satisfied. That's what, as a presenter, I feel that I've accomplished it. I've set the stage so they're independent within that to take the lessons I've just presented in a show and tell time and translate them into that object that they have their goals on, but they learn the lessons. You know, the old adage is you can't take it with you. That is, your material things, you, you're going to be in a coffin someplace and this is all in it. Yes. But you know what you do take with you? It's your knowledge if you haven't shared it. That's over. I wholeheartedly agree with that statement. It always bothers me when I meet a craftsman who's unwilling to share his craft. At a craft group, I don't know what the percentage of the GNP is craft oriented, but it's pretty small. And to have to think in terms of, of cornering a market, it's just nonsense. Yeah, and if you're not sharing that as a craftsman, you're killing that craft yeah. just as much as technology or advancements and, and anything else in society. Yeah, right. I, I have no, no illusion over the originality of what I do any more than I think any craftsman should have. So you've written a book on making tools. Yep. 150 years ago, this was standard in an apprenticeship. It was an expectation that before you became a journeyman, you would show you not only could use the tool, but you could make that, and it became your toolkit. Do you remember the first tool you ever made? Yes, it was a block plane that I saw taught by Adolf Peschke in St. Louis. And it was really special for me to see him be able to teach that. And I'll unabashedly give him credit for getting me started on that. And then once you've done one, you're looking around for others to do. You know, it's like being on the first rung of a ladder. Getting there is the jump. And after that, it's a progress. And the book has actually about 12. First tool you make may not turn out as good as you think. But I gotta tell you, I use tools that I made 15 years ago. They're not as refined as something I'd make today, but they still do the job. And when you make a tool yourself, it's that much more meaningful. In life, Taking that first step is always the hardest part, but if you set your doubt aside, you'll be amazed at what you get in return. So today we're gonna to be talking about planes and uh, hopefully building one, right? Yes. Cool.
I, uh, you brought you know, some. I did. I did. You know, these have been in my family. My, uh, my grandfather was a, a cabinet maker, and I thought it'd be cool if I brought a couple of his molding planes along for you to check what out. What are molding planes? <laughs> you tell no, me. No, that's not, that's not my, my role. Sorry about that. Yeah, he was pretty skilled to have done them himself. I respect someone who's done uh, the traditional style. I do, uh, as you'll see in some of the other ones, uh, somewhat simplified uh, wood body. And uh, I'm, I admire somebody who knew the, knew the old ways. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're an heirloom today, but they were the, uh, the you know, they were everyday uh, useful tools and they're lovely. It's called a shoulder plane because the blade and the sole of the plane are in line, and so you can cut a joint into a square corner. Okay. Traditionally, they take a single block of wood and carve the complicated angles that go in here, the throat, we call it, with chisels and very carefully dimensioning that. So the angle of the blade, which is the blade block, and the angle of the fore one, which is where the wedge is gonna be, exactly match. Now. As you can imagine, that's a little harder than it just looks in the finished planes. And because of that, we've simplified it by making the plane into three pieces. We've got a piece that's the center and two edges that are going to take up the sides of it. Okay. And this is three different, two different kinds of wood, three pieces, so you can see dramatically what we're looking at. The first thing I'm going to do is lay out where the blade wants to come. A little tick mark there. Now, how do you know what angle you're cutting that uh, at? Tradition. Yeah? The angle of the blade has two things going on. One is ease of cut and the other is smoothness. The steeper the angle, the smoother the cut, the more difficult to make it go. Okay. The lower the angle, the easier it is to go, but the more likely you can tear out wood grain. Oh, okay, okay. So there's a trade-off. Where do we start? Well, uh, I think the first thing I'll do is clean off something on this bench so we can do it. I think it's a good idea. Now, if you want to go over to the bandsaw and cut out the two, the four and a half blocks, that's the tool to use. You know, Eric, that's good. I see you've left the line that I drew as a reference because what's going on next, we're gonna sand that surface dead flat on the sander and having that line there will give you a reference point. So okay. go ahead and uh, sand both of these, both straight and square across. We found that when we clamped this, that the glue because it's slippery, allows the two to slip past each other. Right, right. And it's, it's rather frustrating because it's the last little tightening that goes out of line. What we do to keep that from sliding is we put a little salt. Oh, that's a great On tip. the line, and it acts just like sand does on the county road. Oh. That's a great tip. Now we've got this one all in line where we wanted. The crucial thing when we come to putting this in is to have the space between the four and a half blocks, the right distance for our blade and the wedge to go in. How many of these have you made? Well, I make them every time I do a class and I've probably done it about 15, 20 times. Mm. All right. It's nice working here with this. Yeah, you know, I put the glue in the wrong place. How many times have you done this before, Jack? Oh, 15 or 20 times. How many times do you screw it up? Oh, lots of times. John, you know how many times I've welded things upside down? I'll tell you, you know. It's or welded much. the wrong side of something so many game. times. Okay. It's always a bummer, too. At least it's a little easier with the glue. You just scrape it off, you know? Right to the mark. And right on that guide. I like the smell of the wood-burning stove, man.
creates a nice atmosphere to work in, you know? Now, the one, what I'm going to be checking this for is that we get a nice little squeeze out of glue at all the places so we know we have a tight fit. You're not worried about that glue? No. As soon as that started to, uh, to, to skin over, mm -hmm. then we'll take a knife and cut it out. Oh, okay. Now, we're going to leave that to dry. But what we're going to do until that does is we're going to show you how this dimensional tool steel can be hardened and tempered. Oh, cool. Like you see that? Yeah. Okay. Some flames, some oil. Hey, yeah, boys like to play with fire. That's always fun. So we're going to oil quench this. What's the benefit of using an oil quenched steel uh, as opposed to you one know, of the You know, it's the way in which it was formulated as an alloy. Oh, okay. And, and, and what needs to go on is having the crystal structure of the carbon behave in the way that will harden it and then give us the right degree of hardness and toughness in the actual uh, uh, plane when we get done. Okay. So it's going to be a two-stage process. But I've started with a blank that I cut out. You can see it's squared up. And then this has been ground. And did you just grind this down with like a bench grinder or a hand yeah, grinder? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and it, uh, it actually could be hand filed if you wanted to take a little longer because it's soft enough. Oh, okay. Yep. So if somebody wanted to do this at home, they didn't have a, a bench grinder or something, they could do it. It could with be it. filed. Hand filed. And then we round the end because that's going to be uh, some place you want comfortable. Sure, you don't want that digging so, into you. I've got this now uh, to, the, to the bevel angle that the plane requires, and I'm going to take a torch and have you get some gloves on. All right. You're going to be the, this uh, means business. The, the man with the steel. Both of them. Look at that. Not man of steel. Give me man some with steel. Yeah, that's it. And you're going to hang on to it with that. All right. And what I'm going to do with a torch, I'm going to heat the end of that's going to be glowing red. Okay. And when you get it up to glowing red, and I tell you, you're going to take and swirl that in the oil. And what kind of oil are we? Uh, we're using a vegetable it? oil. This is peanut well, soy. How come not whatever. a motor oil? That's what I use. Motor that's oil. what you use. Well, I used it also for a long time, and as I did, I'd get a blue haze. Oh, you don't and like that? I, no. Well, <laughs> well, you teach enough people, and then the, you know, the alarms go off. You know, so. Uh, we use peanut oil okay. uh, in order to have that uh, not behave that so way. So it'll smell good. Okay. Right? Are you ready? Now, you may wonder what we got here. Yeah. That actually, this is a really cool setup. Well, it's nothing more than two tin cans sleeved together with a couple of pop rivets. And a piece of, is this well, railroad iron? Yeah, that's railroad iron. <laughs> that's uh, cool, man. You know, it, it, this is going to get hot, so we don't want it any place that it'll Sure, kill. yeah. I'm intrigued by the railroad iron, though. Where'd you find that? Um, you know, it was one of you my don't father's. want to say, do you? <laughs> my no, I didn't think it. My father had it. But the reason for this is to shield the blade so that the heat will be concentrated. Okay. If it's not there, the heat dissipates right. out and won't work with a small torch. Right, right. Yeah. The part of all of this is to keep it simple and keep it what the, uh, uh, the home craftsman could have. And somewhat safe. Yeah. All right, you ready? Yeah, yeah, let's okay. rock and roll. I like flames. All right, so now, as it gets up to temperature, about 1,200 degrees, it'll start to get a really dull red glow, and then it goes up higher than that toward 1,500 Fahrenheit, and it'll be uh, a bright red. Okay. And that bright red is our indication that we're at the level that the carbon crystals are willing to take a different form. And pretty soon it's going to be uh, cherry red, which is what I want to have now. Are you about ready? Yeah. Okay, when you take this out, you'll see it's red. Now, one on the count of three. One, two, three. All right, let's do this. And swirl it around so you get it equally exposed. And the boiling temperature of oil is 375 Fahrenheit. So we've gone from 1500 Fahrenheit down to 375, and just boom. And that tends to, to form a crystal structure that's going to be very hard. Unfortunately, it's also very brittle. Too brittle to use. Yep. If you were to drop this on the floor, it would crack. Well, we don't want that. No. So how are we going to temper this? Oh, and you used exactly the right word. Oh, good. Tempering. <laughs> Tempering means to take some of the really super hardness out of it and bring it back. Not as soft as the alloy. Right. It won't be like something that could be drilled and filed, but it's going to be halfway back. What's happening, it's called soaking soaking the steel, and it takes that, the crystals that are very hard and brittle, 
and makes them ease off a little bit. And then when we get done with that, we're gonna turn that off because we don't want to quench that. You just wanna let it come down We naturally. want it to slowly air dry and then it'll be that final in-between tempered quality. Eric, while we've got the blade over in the oven to temper, we're gonna take and glue the other half onto the, the plain body. All right, I'm pretty good at gluing. Well, I'm glad to hear that, because you can uh, do it right. Yeah. And we've drawn the lines of the opening, so let's take and spread that around. All right, I'm gonna put a little bit. It's all about technique, really. And when we get done with this, we're going to line it up with the top edge. About ready? Just about. You're faster at okay. it. You've had a lot more practice. Well, tell me when you're ready to go. Another reason why I'm not a woodworker. I'd have glue all over it. Well, we've got some paper towel here if you need. All right, so that's the fat end of glue. Yeah. Okay. Lay this down. Now, you know what? We're going to wait. Remember we told you about... The uh, salt. Yeah, a little salt. Yeah. We're going to salt that line. Can you use sugar for that too? No, sugar crystals aren't sharp uh -oh. like salt crystals are. I mean, you don't need much of that. It's just just a little bit. Yep. <laughs> I think that's so cool. I've never seen that before. Do you think a lot about your legacy? I think very much that the obligation to share. Um, and for me now is, is to have it in writing. Um, I'm a firm believer that books are going to be around for a long time. And I would feel remiss not to have accomplished a couple of more books that would embody what I've been fortunate, both as a craftsman to learn in terms of hand skills, and as an entrepreneur running a business and how to supply the objects that craftsmen use. That's something I feel that I just pray that I've got the opportunity to, to get those things together because, um, because I do regard it as important. You know, Eric, now that we've had the blade come out of the oven and have it tempered, it's time to put your name and date in there because you're proud of this. Absolutely. This, this is part of the legacy. We've got some letter stamps. What do we want to put E? We'll put EG in EG, there. EG, and oh, then you're going to put, uh, you want to put 20, 13, 2013, because this may last more than a century. That's a, actually, that's a really good idea. Talk about pressure. Yeah. As I put my stamp on the blade, I realized that just like that, John Wilson was able to pass a small part of his legacy onto me. And that's what it's all about. Initials and date, congratulations. A legacy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate to have you here. It. Come back. This is the shoulder plane I made with John by my side, and it brought me back to where my love of craft was born. Mm -hmm.